What's up and welcome to the Cinefax Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Casey. And if you're new to the podcast, here I sit down and talk with different filmmakers and creatives. We listen to their stories. I also answer questions that you guys ask, and we also get some tips and tricks along the way. This is episode 41 with Sonny from Redwall Studios. He started a film studio out in San Jose, California in the Bay Area. It's a crazy popular studio and we're kind of just going to talk all about that how's it going man yeah man i'm happy to be here man happy that you that you didn't uh, didn't cut me off next i know that you failed <laughs> to make it happen a couple times for so sure yeah down. no no it's all good man we've been trying to set it up for a while but you've definitely grown a lot more since the probably i don't know probably like two or three years ago that we tried to set this up so yeah man for sure yeah i mean one thing that i've noticed that i do want to dive in um is originally let's just get straight back to the beginning um you were directing music videos you were shooting a lot for a lot of bay area artists um i can't remember all the videos you've done you definitely worked with a lot of even just like some bigger artists um i remember you worked a lot with i'm sue and show banga and you've had just yeah. countless videos so kind of tell me how that all started you started shooting music videos that started a while back man. i want to say I'm terrible with time, but that's got to be at least five years ago. And the way it started was I was a music producer first. And even before that, I played bass in a band. So that's when I kind of caught the bug for just like the arts in general. And then when the band broke up, I was kind of left as a bass player, which you can't really play alone. So from there, I jumped on the garage band, started making beats. And then I think around the time that like the, that was the Canon, what was that full, the one that the, the, the first camera that dropped that had like the super cinema, like all the settings where you could do video on it. I think it was like a T. Or it was either the T2i like, or uh, I mean the T2i and then the T3i were pretty solid. And then, but yeah. the 7D was pretty solid too. I think it was uh, the 7D that had came out and I seen someone filming on it. I was like, yo, that's crazy. It just looks, it looked like movies, you know what I mean? And I was like, let me just take a stab at it. And what I didn't realize is that editing software is super similar to like Pro Tools and Logic, which is what I was already doing. You got your timelines, you got your effects. So when I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, I think I can make a kind of smooth transition here. And not only that, but I'll have clients because I already have a music studio um, creating music. So I did that and man, I it just, it was like, I went down the rabbit hole and I kind of never turned back. I didn't close the studio. Instead what I did was I filled those spots with people who were better at engineering than me. Um, and that's kind of how the whole company started. But yeah, it was definitely because of those Canon cameras. I think our first camera was like a T2i that I got from Costco, I think, like a kit. Yeah, yeah um, dude, for sure. Was, from there, it was over, dude. Pulling, yeah. like, it was, I love that thing, man. What was it, like the so 18 kind of to 55 it came with or something crazy like the, that, like that kit, kit lens? lens? right? Like a super plasty kit lens that had like a super long zoom on it. Yeah. But it was dope, man. I love that camera. That's like my first yeah. start with it. And from there, it was just over, man. For sure. And then, so you definitely started shooting a lot of videos for Bay Area artists. You were on, how long would you say you were on like that music video type grind? Um, that was a grind, man. But I saw a lot of people do it and they would get stuck in the same type of video over and over. It was like a hood video. And I knew I didn't want to do it. And I knew that that was most people's budgets. So I was like, you know what? I did a few of those, probably not even many, probably like two or three, if that. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to get caught in that grind. So what I did was I started investing. First, I'll, I'll get the budget, a couple hundred bucks. And then I would either match that or just put a lot more of my own money in to start building these sets. And I wanted to just instantly be different. So once I did that, I probably did like my first video with maybe 200 bucks. After that, I got 700 bucks. Um, then I got $1,000 and kind of moved up from there. But it was the investments that made it happen. Like it was just me putting in money. And I, I think I only made money that I was able to keep on maybe like my last few videos. Damn. You know what I mean? Like legit, like I, yeah. I never cared for that. Like I knew the, I knew the goal was a bigger, it was a bigger goal. It wasn't just just direct videos. Like I knew I wanted to get into like sets and studio design and whatnot. So everything was kind of just to build the resume, but I was putting every dollar back in, like with crew, with, with props and everything. And most of them was just like me coming out of pocket. I'd be like, damn. I got, you know, several thousand dollars, but I ended up blowing a thousand dollars more than that because I had to put money into it. For sure. So, yeah. You cut out there sustainable. a little bit in the I'm middle, but I think I know it's all good. I think we got most of it. Um, 
yeah it's definitely insane reinvesting in yourself because i remember just seeing your sets and your lighting and i was like damn like this this is insane it was like especially just like in the bay area there wasn't too much stuff going on like that so when you were building yeah. these sets were you building this at redwall before it was actually redwall like before you were renting out redwall yes well i was actually building them out even before that i would just find spaces that people had somebody like a garage or a warehouse i, I rented for the day and then i build sets there because i didn't have redwall like the open warehouse till later down the line like towards like probably towards the tail end of my directing um so I was building them other places, but that got super expensive, obviously, right? Because I'm running the place and I have to get everything there. So I was like, all right, let me just get my own warehouse. And then what's the film studios now, that was just a blank canvas for me to direct. It. So that's why it was just, you know, big open black walls. And I was building all the sets there. And then that's where everything kind of started to shift because people wanted to shoot. And they always wanted, they saw the sets and they wanted to use the sets, but they were commissioned for somebody else. And my mind kind of started switching over to like, you know what? I'm already kind of over the directing part. Let me just start building these one offsets that I haven't even used and then renting them out to other people. So you were kind of at the end of the directing stage. And I feel like that was kind of like where I saw like you were working a lot with Andy um, yeah. and things where you started doing a lot of bigger videos. You did some yeah. for Kid Boo. You did another one for um, I forgot her name. Um, another artist, uh, what was her name? That one video I forgot. Andy did it. I don't well. remember. Those, there was a, those a few where it was starting to get up there in caliber, um, with the with more views and the bigger budgets. But I don't remember because at that point is kind of when I started losing a lot of interest in the directing yeah. part of it, and I was kind of just like, all right, I'm just going through the motions. I was still giving them all, still trying to make the dopest stuff I could. But at that point, it was just more for like, okay, this is going to be for my resume, for the for what I want to do but I didn't have like the best time doing all those videos. And then mm. I was already kind of, Why? Like, I get over stuff pretty quick, man. I was like, I don't want to do that for not, I don't want to do it if I have to do it. I like doing stuff cause I just want to do it like passion projects. And as they started to scale up, I was like, yeah, this is definitely not what I want to be doing full time. Yeah. What didn't you like about, um, was it per se those higher budget videos or just videos in general? What didn't you like about it? I didn't like that every time there's a new hot director, Everyone wants you to do that style. They come to you because they, they like what you've done, but then they want to start implementing these styles of people that are just like, it's like, yo, that's that's not going to work for a couple of reasons. One, it's going to look bad on my end. And two, I'm never going to do it as good as they do. You know, that's so it became nice. that. Yeah. And then on top of that, just egos. I mean, some people got the coolest personalities and some people you just, it was just, there's no amount of money that's going to make it like, yeah, I want to work with that person again. You know? For sure. So, no, I definitely agree. I think one thing I didn't like when I was doing videos was, let's say I did like a effect, like even if I was just experimenting, like they didn't even ask for this. Like I was like, hey, let's do a green screen video. And you just yeah. do like one green screen type video. Then after that you get like, everyone just wants like that from you next. You know what I mean? And it kind of <laughs> yeah. sucks because like, if you yep. do that and it's the same goes with like doing hood videos or anything like that, whatever you produce is what people are gonna ask for you as well from you as well yeah. so yeah but no, I, I, I they definitely do yeah i don't like i like you said as well people coming to you and asking for like the cole bennett type video you know oh, yeah. and that was right yeah. around that time too everyone wanted that look and he's super dope but it's like man that's that's his look like i don't yeah that's not me i don't want to be i don't want to do those styles like i have my own style and they come to me for my style but then during production it's so easy just to start being influenced but you know can we add this and then in post too they want to like oh can I add this type of like no dude, we're not doing that like i want to keep my style and whatnot and then once that starts changing people are asking for that i'm just like it's not even fun anymore you know you're just you're just mm -hmm. battling with them on, on what the overall look should be at the end you know what i mean for sure so once you finally kind of drop the whole shooting music video you were over it you went full on on redwall studio um yeah. in san jose so were you running the audio recording out of that the music production still or how did that um how was were those running yeah. at the same time or yeah in san jose we had we actually had the music studios first and that was a smaller unit next to where, where the film sets are now and then that we kind of outgrew that. And then we ended up buying a nicer music studio out in Fremont, which is where it's currently at. But we kept, well, we kept the warehouse in San Jose and that became the film sets. 
And then we had also uh, we had also another empty warehouse in Fremont because part of that purchase was another unit next door, which is now the dance studio. Mm-hmm. So at first, I don't know if you remember, I did the I announced the film sets in Fremont first, and they were like these mm-hmm. kind of like more cubicle style, and then it kind of just took off from there. And then I realized like, oh crap, it was kind of, it was kind of like an experiment gone right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it worked out. So I was like, wait, I got this three times bigger warehouse in San Jose. So I kind of transformed it out there. And instead of doing like cubicle styles, like, let me go for bigger stuff that we can get bigger production, uh, like choreo, cars. I want, I just want the scope to feel bigger each time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what I moved it from Fremont to San Jose. I think you became a staple um, in the Bay Area music scene. I think pretty much everyone has shot a video in the Bay Area at Redwall Studios, at least. Yeah, man, it's a gift and a curse for sure, <laughs> for sure, for sure, man. Because, like, there's still people who like been wanting to shoot there forever, and there's people who are like been there four times already, and they're like, "Damn, how do I change space up a little?" Yeah, so it's a tough. Sure. It's definitely tough knowing when to start switching things up there. Yeah, because I've I've seen you play around with a lot of things a lot, and it I me shooting there, I did realize like you can only shoot so much in the um led type set which was sick but then after a while you have to figure out new ways but i haven't been back and i've been seeing it switched up so much um but it's just definitely crazy the led set that original led set we can show on the screen um what do you call that set by the way if i call it the that's time i I honestly call it the led wall but when people need more descriptive i say it's the horizontal horizontal leds and it's just one of those things where it's just it's the scale of it that makes it what it is you know what i mean for sure it's like not rocket science it's just so good when you see it on camera especially like 16 by 9 if you shoot it right just that wide angle everything just looks massive because you got that wraparound lighting so i love yeah. that thing man like it looks uh, sick. i, I want to keep it forever if possible for sure and you've definitely added all sorts of like little tweaks and whatnot that just make it easy for someone to like pull in just get the shots they need and you were even featured. I, I think I was just on Peer Space. Always since we have our studios, I'm always browsing through Peer Space and just yeah. keeping up to date with everyone. But it's definitely interesting. Uh, they hella use your photo like right there on the main page. So they that's do. pretty sick. Yeah, yeah, that's I pretty that fire. I, and, I, and I screenshot. I was like, yeah, that's dope. I had no idea. Yeah, so Peer Space is dope. showing some love. Yeah, dude. It's just it's it, it works well. It's just visually uh, it's visually appealing. Is what it is. For sure. So. Talk to me a little bit about your booking process. Do you prefer people to book specifically through peer space or do you do it on your website or which, which method do you prefer and what would you recommend for people starting out? That's a good question. Peer space is definitely a must. Um, I feel like it, it attracts a certain level of professionalism when it's peer space, because it's a lot more attached to it. It's like renting a hotel, right? You're going to, you're going to respect the place a lot more, but the downside is they take a hefty percentage and they don't pay you out right away. So you've done the work, you've paid out your expenses, but now you got to wait, what, seven days after your completed rental to get your money. So that part kind of sucks, but the insurance, uh, the ability to have them read everything before they book is super dope. But I would say we kind of, we kind of figured out a booking method directly with the clients where we're able to weed out a lot of like the kind of the bullshit, you know what I mean? Cause we've had, you know, we've had people that want to come for, for the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know I mean, they're not serious about the craft or like, yeah, I just really wish we didn't run into these people. Um, so we have, we have a good system now, but I would say it's like peer space is crucial now for people that don't know about your space. And if they're coming mm-hmm. in town, like you need peer space, but you need to have a solid way to book them separately too. Cause a lot of those people will come back and they're not, they're just going to call you direct. Next time. For sure. So you gotta be able to book them, you know, on your own and have a good, good method in place. Yeah. And I think you also have to be careful too, like trying to go around peer space on peer space. Yeah. Cause I think they will, they don't really like that. I mean, it makes sense from a business makes, standpoint, yeah. but yeah. yeah, you just have to be careful of that. You can't just be like, Hey, Venmo me $150 or whatever. No, the con- no, no. You, you definitely can't do space, that. I'd rather keep it just on tier space. Yeah. Cause they can turn around too and say like, yo, they, they, they wanted me to book direct. And all of a sudden I'm like, I don't even want to know what peer space would do actually. If they found that. I'm For like, sure. Just cut the listing off. So 
I definitely, I definitely appreciate what they do, man. It's an awesome thing. And like the insurance and all that, it's super, it's super comfortable. You know? so, yeah. It's, it's, I definitely think the insurance is like a big thing and it's, it makes it so much easier. Just like share grid. If you've ever rented yeah. gear, it's just nice having that insurance through there. You don't have to deal with all that, especially like if you're dealing with bigger productions and whatnot, you don't want to have to like get their production insurance and all, I don't know, deal with all that. If yeah. it's all through peer space, it's, it's cool. It's, um, you're paying for the convenience, man. It's totally worth it. Yep, the convenience. Mm -hmm. So what I remember for a while you had like a motel set and you had this whole other little wing of Redwall Studios. Yep. What kind of feedback and like what kind of made you like mold Redwall Studios uh what it is today? What what kind of feedback have you received? Um that's just kind of made yeah. you adapt. Okay, so so the motel scene was in the old music studio. Mm -hmm. So the only reason I built that out was because we still had we were still on the line for the lease, and it was mm -hmm. just sitting there empty, right? At that point, we had already moved the music studio over to Fremont, so I had about seven hundred fifty square feet of just blank space, and it still had the build out in it, so it had multiple rooms. So I think I did, I did the motel set in there, and I think in the back, I even had a uh, was it interrogation room or like a I forgot what it was, but I think it was interrogation room back there. But that I knew I was only gonna have until that lease ended. So when that lease was done, I already knew I was getting rid of it. That was kind of temporary. But as far as adapting, I don't, funny enough, I don't get a lot of feedback as far as like, yo, you should do this. To be honest, I get more like, oh, dope. I didn't even think about that. Or like, I wanna see what you come up with next. Like most people I think trust us to be like, yo, what can you guys do? You know what I mean? Yeah. So we don't get a lot of feedback. And if we do get feedback, a lot of times it's stuff that we don't wanna do. It's like, yo, put another jail set in there or put some nets. I'm like, I don't, I don't really want to do that. For uh, sure. So yeah, my inspiration mainly comes from like, I would say probably like photography, architecture, things that just feel bigger in scale is what I'm kind of going for. You know what I mean? I like things, I want like a car to pull in and have it feel like a, like an editorial photo. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want the lighting to be dramatic. I want, I want it to feel, I just don't want it to feel cheap. You know what I mean? I want yeah. it to be where it's just like, yo, you got beautiful lighting from everywhere. Everything's been thought out, convenient. And I think my resume of just building different sets has, has allowed me that flexibility where people are just like, yo, I want to see what you do next. You know I mean, not so much like try this or try that. I do, I do ask for feedback, but like I said, most of the time when it comes back, it's stuff that I'm like, eh, I thought about it. Or I just don't necessarily want to do that. You know what I mean? For sure. And I think you can also just tell by like how booked out your studio is and like, what pictures are like you know what people tend to go to when they shoot you can obviously see what they're yeah. actually shooting on because like at yeah, our exactly. studio our most popular photo and our most popular set is like that neon 80s grid I floor love that thing, dude. That yeah it's so pretty sick. it's sick so we love that we've been trying to think of different ways that we're gonna like modify it and upgrade it um and then so it's that and then people love like the led wall which is like obvious like it's a yeah big ass led yeah. wall we want a bigger one but like the cool thing about the square one though is you can like go really far back and you can like film it like with the floor and everything so like not yeah. like you're actually like so you can kind of you know put like some more artistic stuff i really like the uh crazy projector that you have that you can like shape to like any different type of shape so yeah, that's super dope. Yeah. that thing's pretty sick um and I love just like the different like methods and ways you came up with like using it. It's uh, so is that thing still rocking? Um, it is. It's just it's not the most convenient thing to use. So it's more like a specialty mm -hmm. item. It's not included when you book, but people know about it. So they'll be like, yeah, I want to use it. So they add it's additional fee. It requires definitely receiving files from them, you know, testing it out because yeah. um, you can project onto anything. So the problem with that is the problem is you got to really figure out like, you know, what's the budget and do you want to do it on a car? If it's going to be on a car, the car has to be white. You know what I mean? Are we going to do it on some boxes or we're going to do it against the wall? Um, and then coming up with how to make it pop because it doesn't look too good. If you just blast it against the wall, you actually want to put it on, you want to put it into 3d space. You know what I mean? You want to have like maybe our led wall on the back, something hanging and then the projection on that. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. And stuff. So it's a lot more, uh, work in the process and and not only that so we don't we don't include it but yeah you can you can definitely add it for a fee and it gets a lot for of sure. interest but once people start figuring out how long it takes they're like all right maybe we'll you know they really consider if they want to pay for it or not yeah for sure yeah i know i know i did that one video that hatched it with like the flames on the kamaya video 
or that yeah. Damien Sandoval did. That looks super sick. And then I think we did another video, but I mean, I'm sure he's seen all the footage beforehand. I mean, it was really cool. I mean, um, I guess just like with the projection, you also have to just watch out from shadows, but it shadows, looks really yeah. solid. Yeah. Yeah. That actually, that setup was dope. That was real tight because the scale of it. And I think it was, we had, um, put what was like kind of like that glowing box in the center, right? Oh yeah, it had the glowing yeah. box. Yeah. So that that was able to light the subject without washing off the imagery. And the only thing we had to battle there was just the shadow of yeah of the projector coming in, uh, sure. which I thought about installing permanently and just putting it so high up at an angle that it's kind of not a factor. But like I said, it's still one of those things where if we if we're gonna do that every time, it's gonna require a lot of a lot of conversation with the client prior to figure out what they want on there. So. Matter of fact, how do you guys do with with the with the LED wall? How much like programming goes into that for each client? Um, it's so we have like a Mac back there right now, and I talked to like I was talking to my site rep guys yesterday, and we're having some trouble with it. But basically, we have a bunch of preset stuff, obviously like some stock footage, and then we have like different like subscriptions to stock sites like Storyblocks and whatnot. Yep. So if they want to go back there, they can just download something. And then we just have to have our site reps import it into the program. It's like basically what people use for like LED walls at concerts. It's like Resolume yeah. or something like that. Um, our site reps are probably listening to this mad at me, but uh, <laughs> And basically you can, it has all sorts of preset effects. Like you can add pulsing, you can change the hue. It's kind of like an editor, but it just loops over and over again. Yeah. yeah and then yeah. you could like stack different assets on top of it. So it's pretty cool. It's like kind of like once you learn the basics, you could do it real quick. And then we also have Perfect. like, it's just with like the Mac is like what we're trying to figure out right now. If like we should go to Mac or PC, we're on Mac on just like a little laptop, but like, it's cool. Cause you could, people could airdrop something. Yeah. if they want to import it real quick but yep just the pcs are a little bit more powerful or just like i don't yeah, know yeah yeah so i got a question if someone wants to open their own studio what is one thing that you think what's one thing that they're probably not thinking of and it's like one of the biggest challenges that go along with opening Ooh. and running a film studio that's the million dollar question man i get that i get that that dm who knows how many times a week where it's just like, how do I do it? How do I do it? Okay. Right, if you're going to do it, do it. Cause you love it. Like make sure that that film or cinematography, photography, whatever is your passion. If you don't love it, it's going to fail period point blank. There's just, there's just, no, there's, there's no such thing as a cash grab. There's nothing which is easy, right? Like it's going to be years of, of understanding lighting, understanding business, what people want, how to run an operation like that. So if it's not your passion and you're just doing it for money, because a lot of people do that, but I got some money I want to do. It looks like you're doing well. It's like, yeah, but I also failed for five years before that to get to this point. You know what I mean? For sure. So I think, I think, and a lot of people that want to do it, or a lot of people that I've looked into their profiles, they, they have no background in, in anything mm -hmm. with film related. So I'm like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But if you love it, if you love it, just do, I, would, I don't know, I would say if you love it, take aspects of like what you've done in your videos that people have liked and build that, you know what I mean? Like use that as your resume, like, look how good this can look on camera. You know I mean? And whatever you do, don't just go rip off what the next guy's doing. That's becoming really common now if you were just like, you know, I don't know, borrowing ideas or taking ideas. And it's like, yo, there's enough money for everybody, but just be original. Because if not, what you're going to do is you're going to end up just kind of messing up the market, really. You know what I mean? Just trying yeah. to be the cheapest, the cheapest. That's how we end up with, you know, everyone trying to compete with the same set. But it's like, yo, man, just be creative. Like, or if you're gonna, For if sure. you're gonna borrow it, like, add something to it or change it. Exactly. Like, That's what I was gonna say. Yeah. If you're gonna borrow something, at least remix it, add a little something, yeah. add your own twist. Make the make the person who originally made it be like, oh, like that was a good idea, you know? Exactly. Like, oh, shit. Exactly. Nah, yeah. I, I saw a few Redwall ripoffs down in LA, so I'm I'm excited that you'll be out there because I'm sure yeah. you've seen the, the Redwall ripoff and I've seen LA. a couple, which I got nothing against, man. I, I like that. Like there's pros and cons, right? When you see it, you get kind of bummed out because you're like, yo, you know, like, you know that they borrowed some ideas and it's it just you never you know but the good thing is it shows that the market is growing like there's a need for for spaces right so sure. that's a good sign but i think what's happening now is there's going to be a point when people are going to have to at least understand like how to not be in each other's ways so that we can make the market grow and work together mm -hmm. as opposed to being like oh that dude's got a dope set let me rip it and just knock off 50 bucks you know what i mean because yeah. what's going to happen is 
we don't just make up the prices. We actually sit there and go, okay, this is the amount we need to cover our costs, to operate, to be able to continue to build. And when people get into the game, they just look at it like, oh, if they're charging that rate, I'm instantly just gonna beat them. But they don't understand, it's like, no, man, you gotta think about your payroll, your insurances, your leases. There's mm -hmm. so much that goes into it. And I think a lot of people just hop in and go, okay, how do I undercut? And then you're like, see, what's happening is you don't realize that like, you might win some business, but one, you're probably not gonna do it the same because you don't have a lot of experience in it. And two, you're gonna get to a point where you cannot continue to operate it at that cost. And then exactly. people get used to that cost. And then we all have to raise our rate again. People are like, well, I don't want to pay that. Well, it's like, well, you, you kind of, you know, you screw the marks. It's the same reason when, when you go to different stores, the iPhone costs the same price, you know what I mean? Or cameras cost the same price because they're, they're protecting the market. If not, someone can buy that camera for hundred bucks and sell it for 101 and just do quantity all day. But then mm -hmm. you screw up the market overall, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, that goes for anything in business though. That you have to really protect the market. You got to one, understand that you're part of the market and then, and then work to make that market bigger. The minute you start undercutting people, it's, it's a, it's a temporary win. And then I've, I've seen people just slowly just their product goes down because they have no, there's no finances for upgrades and changing things and growth and paying their people. So you get turnovers and, and like for us, we like to pay our site reps good. We like to make sure that everyone sticks around for a long period of time so they can give a better experience. You know what I mean? We're not sure. just doing it for quick dollars like we want. I mean, this stuff's expensive. A lot of stuff we do and put in here, like it's, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars, but we want to make sure it's the dopest. You know? No, exactly. And that's um, one thing we tried to do. Like, like the reason like why we started Cinepack Studio is mm -hmm. we saw the other studios in LA. We saw what they were doing and we instantly had ways that we wanted to improve and like I think that's where it can come from as well. Like let's say you go shoot at yeah. a bunch of studios and you're like, oh, I wish I had this or I'm always renting mm -hmm. this or, you know, I'm always building this in my garage. Like if you can take that problem that you always have and turn it into your studio, that's one way that you can go about it as yeah. well. One problem we saw is it was annoying. Like we let's say we did like these run and gun shoes for like our Cinepax promos. And we go to a shoot and they would want to charge for it. And I had to hear it from other studios. They charge me for a table. They charge me for a Bluetooth speaker. Oh, they charge cool. me for a C stand. Yeah. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, it's fine to charge for like, we have a fogger that a uh, hazer that we rent out. It's a four or 500. It's Andy's original, like $500 hazer. Like yeah. we rent it out for like, I don't know, like 20 something, 50 bucks, which is, which is reasonable. That's what it goes for on share grid. And we even do a little bit cheaper because it's, you know, it's an expensive hazer, but like yeah. the C stands, the Bluetooth speaker, all that stuff, it's all included. Like you guys can use it. Like yep. just makes it easier. You don't have to load in as much stuff. You don't, how many times do you end up somewhere and you're like, oh shit, my, I don't have my Bluetooth speaker. Or even if you don't think about it and you just turn it on. So that's one thing yeah. that we wanted to do with our spaces. It just originally, and I know you always have a Bluetooth speaker. You haven't, you've never charged me for a, a Bluetooth speaker or anything like that. No, so. man, we don't, we yeah. don't charge for those things. It's like, it's super awkward because one, you're going to get into uncomfortable conversations about like, why I have to pay an extra 20 bucks for something that's sitting right there. Two, yeah. that piece of gear makes the space look better. So sure. you're only ruining it for yourself. It's like now, now your client's not going to get the full experience. And when they talk about it later, they're going to be like, eh, it wasn't what I thought it was. Or it wasn't like the photos yeah. because they didn't want to pay for everything. It's like here we give you everything except actually everything. There's there's some Astero tubes that are not included for, for obvious reasons. Yeah. But everything else, even down to the laser now is included where it's yep. like those things are bank you know what i mean and, but it's just included for the convenience like there's you know there's refrigerators tables chairs wi-fi everything it's included it's a fog machine we refill it all the time so i think that should be included because that's how you promote it if you promote the space that way that's how mm -hmm. they should be able to receive the space you know what i mean uh, but yeah the other side is kind of gouging i've seen people do it it's like i get it yeah. i respect the grind but it's like sometimes the space will be super cheap but then you see why, because the add-ons are crazy. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, speaker, this and that. You're like, yo, I'm, I mean, just want just combine it, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So I, I definitely, and it's kind of like that. Like I, we went to rent a uh, peer space. We were doing a promo with these like parkour guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just wanted this parking lot. I saw it pop up in, uh, in LA and I was like, oh, this is perfect. So I go and then like we get the cleaning fees and we only have like two hours. And they're like, okay. And you also have to pay for like security. And it came out to like, I wanted it for like two hours. And I think it was originally like a hundred bucks an hour. It came out to like 
eight to nine hundred dollars for like two yeah. hours and i was just like dude mm-hmm. like and this literally t- yeah and I, I didn't even book it we ended up booking something else i'm just like that's not even worth it like exactly. like it's just like where you like get to check out and the price gets way higher like yeah. i feel like you have less chance of like if it's if you're more up front and you charge a little more and then your cleaning fee's not crazy you might actually get that sale or get that booking so yeah that's actually a good point i don't we don't even have a cleaning fee maybe we should oh, consider okay. that though Maybe yeah, that, we, that's we kind of just kind of included though, you know. Yeah, I think we include that just to like kind of pay our site reps. I think we put that as like our site rep type fee, something okay. in there. I yeah, but I mean that's like that's one of the first that. things we realized in the beginning is um, when people came in, they'd be like they go to one room and they'd be like, wait, like how much is this room or how much to use the LED wall? Yeah. Like, no, like this is all included. Like you can you can shoot whatever you want. So I mean that was pretty cool. Um, yep but yeah a lot of people say that too like how much to rent this room and send a picture i'm like i'm like one it's not really a room but you get access to everything and that's kind of like a selling point like what i get all that stuff like yeah it's like all right book me lock me in like no you don't have to pick and choose you know yeah we've thought about it though we're like well if if we put x amount into each of these like we could probably rent them separately but it's just like it's people are going to walk in they're going to see it they're going to want it and then we're that's i'd rather avoid the uncomfortable conversation and give people exactly what they saw yeah i mean one thing that we've realized though too is like lighting upgrades so we have like andy has like some of his lights there like a 600d just like some bigger lights that you would normally rent and andy uh people are down to pay upgrades for those like i mean obviously it's like a 1500 hundred dollar light we can't include that just the wear and tear on it but like people are down to just like especially in la are just down to like add that on if it's already convenient for them you know um, yeah. so that's one thing, but, uh, what's it called? Talk a little bit about, you had the I eight BMW. Do you still have it or no, man? So that thing was dope. <laughs> that thing I had and never had to pay because it just got rented out in the studios. And then about, what was it? No, a year ago, a little shy of a year ago, we ended up buying a house in Vegas to, to start this operation. And then I brought the car out here and I was like, all right, this is going to be a bad daily driver to have. Cause I didn't want to leave it in San Jose. That's where it was because if I, if I wasn't in San Jose, I was going to be here for months. And then we just pick up the mortgage of a house. I'm like, you know what? Let me get rid of this thing. Cause I have no idea what this is going to be like, like a new studio, a new house. And it's still having this car and then sold it, opened up this studio not too long after, and then almost instantly regretted it. I was like, damn, could have totally done it. Would have been awesome because here people always fly in and don't have a car. Yeah. And they're like, yo, do you have a car then? They see so many of the dope cars that have been here. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, shit, man, it would have been perfect. So considering doing it again, but at the same time, it's like another thing is that there's so many car rentals here that people just come through with like everything. You know what I mean? So there's no yeah. shortage of cars. They just don't have them when they come in. I'm kind of like, well, I don't know. Let's just, let's just let it rock as is. And then when the site reps here, he has to move it, you know, we would have to move it in and out each time. And then when people see it, it's another one of those things where they see it, they go, why can't you just pull it in? Let me use it. Um, so I'm like, I don't even want to deal with that right now, but in the future, it might be dumb to do that yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's probably pretty fun driving an AI BMW. So when it's free, it's the best. Dude. Yeah. That's it's the sick. fucking best for sure. Yeah. That's sick that it could definitely pay for itself. Cause I mean, it has those butterfly doors, which I think just give it that like video. Look. I see them all the time. I, yeah. yeah. It's a sick yeah, car. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I definitely do see what you're saying with the Vegas market. Like a lot of people go out there, they'll spend a bunch of money and they'll rent car, crazy cars. You can even rent yep. like for an hour and whatnot. So let's talk a little bit about the move to Vegas because tell me what uh, went through that thought process. What made you want to move for, to Vegas? Um, just give me a little rundown on that. Yeah, man. So Vegas started, the whole seed got planted when we would take uh, company trips out here. So we bring the guys out here. This is way before having a house out here in the studio. We bring the guys out here years ago and we loved it. It was just a cool vibe. Like, you know, it's just, it's just, it's an entertainment. It's, it's a lot like LA in the sense that it's entertainment driven. Right. Um, so we come out here a lot. We realized, yeah, we want to like, we, we should probably consider expanding the business out there. Right. It was between LA and Las Vegas, but Vegas kind of wanted us over because we would go there a lot. We would go there just to hang, you know, we'd come here and hang out. And then we're like, well, you know what? Let's just try it. And then obviously did some research, realized that the market was kind of open. Um, so about a year ago, we, we picked up a house to have a home base. We knew we wanted to be here regardless, even if the studio didn't work out. 
So we picked up the house, it was a cool at the home base, waited a few months and then got the studio, built it out. Um, and then it kind of worked, man. It's just, it's, 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 it worked and it brings a whole different level of like clientele, completely different, right? Like this, you know, like just earlier today and yesterday we had EDC DJ because EDC was in town, right? So whatever's in town, we tend to, we tend to, you know, like it's like weightlifters are coming in, they're going to be bringing doing photo shoots mm-hmm. and whatnot. So it's dope because it's a change of pace. You still get your music videos, but then you get to meet all kinds of people from all different walks of life from different parts of the world that came in for something specific. And I think that's a dope, a dope change of pace for, for our business. So it's not just a hundred percent music videos. You know what I mean? So it's like, we already started expanding with the dance thing and then now automotive is getting big. And then, um, obviously music video, uh, products, you know, just anything that could, that could use what we have as a backdrop. It just kind of, I don't know, it, it works, you know? Yeah, no, I, I like that, that it's not strictly just music videos because I do feel like the Bay area is a little stuck in that, like where yeah. you would get a lot of music videos, but even still, I saw a bunch of crazy stuff being shot at Redwall that isn't music videos. Like you had, um, some type of Google ad shot there, which was pretty sick. That was at Fremont, yeah. right? Yeah. That was in Fremont. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was sick, but, um, I definitely like that. Like any, and there's so many artists still that come through Vegas, like you're saying, like EDC. So were they like music videos or like live sets or what was kind of going on there? No, these were, I think the, I'm not sure what today was. Cause I was sitting out here in the lobby. The other one from the other day was, I believe a car manufacturer linked up with the DJ and kind of, oh, okay. he was a talent in front of that. Um, but it's just everything, man. Some people come do their sets here. We've had, um, Vegas shows do like their promo reels here. And yeah. then we'll go to like the show and it'll be playing there. It's super dope. Yeah. I've uh, seen the Jabberwockies, yeah. right? Yeah. Sorry, they came man. the first week. Dude. It was like yeah, the craziest, sick. the wildest thing ever. It was just like, it was probably like the best welcome to Vegas we could have possibly had. You know what I mean? It yeah, for sure. And we had talked about it. So we're like, yeah, if the Jabberwockies have a cup, we pretty much made it. You know what I mean? And then a week later or a week after opening, they hit us up. It's like, wow <laughs> crazy dude the wildest yeah. the wildest thing ever man so that was a real good war like a warm welcome for sure um but yeah dude vegas has just a bunch of different different talents that come through for different things. a lot That's of sick. dance too a lot of dance. nice for sure and then business side of that are you doing better on the taxes side being in nevada or does it not really work like that no we are we're still paying as we're paying california taxes Wow, because and, the LLC is in California or what? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not too deep on that, but we have a CPA and we talked about it. We're like, hey, this should change things, right? Like, it's not worth it's not worth the hassle. You're you're still a California based company, yeah. and you're gonna pay those taxes. Like, oh, yeah, man, no funny. way around it. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a way around it, but it's just not worth it. Yeah, for sure. It's not worth yeah. it. That's something I, that's like not worth screwing around with. You know? No, yeah, taxes suck. Taxes but, super suck. Dude. Yeah, super suck. Super yeah, suck, so. Yeah. But yeah, that's cool. No, I definitely like the move to Vegas. I thought that was super smart. And then I'm sure you even I've even seen tons of people who are fans of the Red Wall in San Jose. You know, people take trips out to Vegas all the time. Just say, hey, yeah. you know, like, let's just go shoot out there. So, I mean, I think it's solid. And I like that it's a little bit different too. You got the, what do you call that? Like the Chevron style. What do you call that? Style? Yeah, yeah. We took so like those kind of like the, the yeah the Chevron style, but the, it's like the arrows and neon arrows. Kind of like those. So that's obviously a play off of the LED wall in San Jose. We wanted something of that scale, but not the same thing. So we wanted to have the same impact, and that design just it lends itself well. It just gives it it gives it like motion. You know, what I mean, you look at mm-hmm. it, it just feels like something's moving or, or something's going on because of the angles to it. Uh, but I sketch I must have sketched out like a hundred different things on that wall. Like the first thing I did was like paint it take a picture of it and then spend like countless nights at home just drawing different uh you know different setups and yeah we even consider doing the same exact one just because i'm like well it's a whole new market it'll probably work you know what i mean but i was like nah, i want to challenge and i think we hit it pretty well with this one um there's always some things i want to do like the only thing with this one that i wish i would have done and still can do is completely wrap around like it's only on the back wall and it doesn't wrap around but it's a lot taller than our San Jose one as far as the mm. scale of it. So not as wide this way, but taller. So it still has it still has that impact. But I think if I wrap around that soft lighting will get even it'd be even nicer. Yeah. And one thing we didn't even talk about too is one of my favorite sets is what you do with the 
what do you call them the driveways the ton the car tunnels vehicle tunnels yeah. are sick i definitely Appreciate like that, that yeah. i think yeah that's that's super sick because i don't know music videos cars you get all that in it's one like, you know they tie in so perfectly right perfectly like, that yeah. was so much wasted space I, I learned that in san jose when i realized that people were just housing all their gear in that area and it was just a mess and yeah. i was like that's a lot of open space that's being completely wasted you know what I mean? mm -hmm. and i was like and i started thinking about like wait that's literally a carport why mm -hmm. don't we build this thing out had our contractor come and do it and it was just like it was just it was probably one of our better moves for sure for sure sick let's get into i got some questions on instagram that people sent over let's check these out first question joseph media wants to know did he look for a specific spot to build the san jose studio or uh or build it to the spec of the space it's in no that was just because we were in that lease and that was obviously the blank canvas for me to, to shoot my own videos in so mm -hmm. the sets were adapted to what we already had Vegas different because we were able to find something that like Vegas we we looked for a very specific layout, but San Jose was just that's what we had. Gotcha. And what's the square footage um, of San Jose and Vegas? Vegas. I think they're identical, two thousand square feet. One. Okay. This one might be twenty one. I'm not too sure, but they're 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 both between two thousand and twenty two hundred square feet. Next question. Jara Rojas wants to know how does it feel to be where you're at? Um, it feels good when you look back and realize what you built over time. But as you know, as a creative, it's just never, it's every day you're like inspired more or want to do more and you feel like you're in the same exact spot. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever feel like that. You just feel like because there's so much to learn and so much to do that you're like, well, I don't, it's hard to feel the growth and feel anything when you're in it. Um, but obviously when you meet people who've been able to watch your growth, that's when you kind of go, oh, damn, you're right. I've been doing this for a while. And it's kind of cool, but it's, I don't think like that. Like my mind is always just thinking on the next set, the next idea, the next concept video, the next, you know, it's just always focused on that, which is hard to turn off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's creative. We just, we're always thinking to staying up and working on ideas. So you never really get to think about what you've, what you've done. You know what I mean? For sure. I think it is good to do that as well. Cause sometimes, especially like, I feel like just like working digitally sometimes, yeah. um, whereas like you're not physically making anything. I don't know if that makes sense, but like where like you don't see what you've accomplished in a day sometimes. Like if I spend all day editing, like it's kind of like, if I don't finish the edit, I feel like I didn't accomplish anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, like if it's not exactly. like exported, even though let's say I cut like 80% of the video or something, I don't know, just sometimes I don't feel very accomplished. Like I feel like- Yeah, it's gotta be done. It's, if it isn't done, it's like I'm a failure for the day. I do it. Like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's it's kind of good to just look back what you did throughout the day or just over the years. But last questions. Uh, Stephen Michael uh, wants to know what's your number one tip on running a film studio? Passion, love it, love it, understand it, and understand that when people come in there, they're not going to be as familiar with it as you are. So you have to see what their vision is and see like, okay, they were planning on doing this. How can I, how can I help them take it further than that with what I know with this space? You know, what I mean, because they might come in and start setting up lights and go, wait a minute, we already have that pre-installed or we have this nice backlight, or I can switch this color up, or that intensity. Like, yeah, they might turn something on and be like, this looks great. But if you drop the intensity down, now you can level out some lights and get better looks. You know I mean? Or you have too much fog. You're gonna have no you're gonna have no contrast in your video. You know what I mean? So taking their vision, adding value, that's what it is. They come mm -hmm. in with an idea, and if you take that idea to the next level, you're a superstar with them. You know what I mean? Yep. Everything's adding value. I think I think that's good though. And I think that comes down to you working there but also like your site reps hi teaching them and mm -hmm. just finding people who care and want to actually add value to it's not someone who's just gonna sit in the back and you know open the yeah. door and just you know someone who's actually like there if they have any questions like hey where can i plug this in yada yada just like simple stuff like that is always going above yeah above they gotta be proactive help. man they have to be like our, we take our site reps like that position is very, very serious to us because that's literally the link between the client and our company. So I always check in with our clients and ask how it was, and and you know, ninety nine percent of the time they're they're raving about them because we like we have high expectations and they take care of them and they take care of the space. You know what I mean? For sure. 
what is if you want to talk about it do you have a horror story of something that you maybe learned from um early days of running the studio or just like some big mistakes that you may have made when starting out or just any time of running the studio biggest mistake would be being too nice if, you, if people will take advantage of, of if you don't have set rules that you enforce you're going to get taken advantage of period mm -hmm. point blank so for us we realized that if we didn't start collecting valuable information from the clients they're not going to feel they, they're, they're going to feel like they're just not liable for anything so the minute we start taking ids and, and names and, and you know uh, deposits or full payments in front that changes everything because now they're telling their friends like yo take care of the space don't do this and then really really regulating the amount of people that can come in we're not a place you want to we, we're not we build sets that don't lend themselves well to big groups mm -hmm. they work well as like you standing in front of it your product in front of it a car in front of it but we're not here for the 20 30 40 people sets like that's not who we are that's and we'll recommend you to other places if you if that's what you're going for there's other places that are designed for that but that's not who we want we want different people that are coming in with you know minimal amount with the crew and that want to specifically use the sets that we have and they understand like yo i'm not just i don't want to just throw 50 people in front of that set you know mm -hmm. so that, that's the biggest thing i learned is that you have to really enforce your rules and you can't budge on them. That's it. Even yeah. if it's money, it's easy to be like, yo, I'm going to, I'm going to give you an extra couple hundred bucks to let 20 people. And that's where, that's where shit goes bad. For sure. Yeah. No, I think sticking to that and the people rule is definitely a big one because it just causes problems and people don't care about yeah. sets. People step on stuff, no, break exactly. stuff. So you also have to, when you're building sets, I think, or like coming up with ideas, you have to think of things that are going to last that don't take a lot of maintenance. You kind of have to find that sweet spot because like a white psych wall, I think the is the, is the, the worst. Did you, have you ever had a white psych wall? I've had two. I've built one and acquired one in the old, or in the, in the Fremont dance yeah. studio. It used to be a photography studio and it had a white psych in there it's the worst like when i see people building them in their studios i'm like dude you have no, no. idea what you're signing up for man you're like you're repainting it all the time you might do a tour and someone doesn't know and steps on it and now you're, you're like you're just doing a tour you're not getting paid now you got footprints on it mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's a, it's a disaster and then if you walk up the side you crack a hole in it it starts crack it's just it's all bad you need a lot of light to light it up mm -hmm. it's just people don't think about it just it just I think the thing with psych walls is just that's what people assume a film studio is yeah in their mind so they go i'm gonna open one and bam i can get someone to build that and then you start realizing like you know how many times can someone actually film on literally blank space you know? and it's a dope concept it's but cool. there's people who have who have that and that's all they do and it's like you know go there because it's going to be lit properly it's just going to be everything space you need. Take, ex exactly don't just try to throw it up and pop some lights on the side and get crazy shadows like it's just all bad idea. to me for I sure I think. no yeah you definitely want like something with a grid above like we mm -hmm. did green screen studio down in burbank that was sick it had like all the space lights we didn't have to do anything just flicked them on yep. put the booties on and it, it was a little expensive, but it was just worth it. You know, like yep. I've rent, I've rented uh, some places. I've actually been the reason I've been that videographer <laughs> that took advantage of a space. And we were the reason they have a limit on the amount of people that can come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I've been that. Yeah, I've been that. that yeah. So it was uh, they're closed now. I, I don't know if you ever seen it. They had a little psych wall in um, where is it? Berkeley. It was like SRGK Studios. They were around for a little bit. Yeah, I filmed, don't know them. yeah, I filmed a video with uh, these rappers, Mike Sherm and some other guys, and um, they just, I, dude, I think I had like, I, you can look in the video. There's probably like 40 people on this little tiny cycle, <laughs> and it's yeah. it's so bad. Like that's and all like, bad, man. Yeah. yeah, and then after that, they're just like next time they're like hey like how many people are you gonna have and then after that i was the rule that was enforced so i wasn't mad yeah. at it i felt bad but uh um, yeah we've all done that's that's kind of like a the beginning stages as a, as a filmmaker you just want to get the video done and you don't even think about the logistics you're just like cool show up here not realizing they're going to come with 40 people you know what i mean yeah. and then that becomes a nightmare because now you're trying to instruct that many people and it's exactly. just it's just it's chaos if people don't realize like if you just come more just lean as a team you'll get way more done yeah. Like way, way more 
for sure. For sure. Yeah, there's there's a point where you have too many people and you're not all in sync and everyone's doing different stuff. Yeah, but, that's that's yeah. the worst. Once it's out of control like that, like good luck trying to get it back, man. For sure. So, are there any last things you want to talk about or any tips for anyone looking to get into a studio? We got passion. We got to do it for the right reasons and make sure you're into it. Any other advice or anything else you want to throw out there? Um, be realistic, man. You got to really be realistic with your with your abilities. There's a lot of there's a lot of construction that goes into it. And on top of that, even if you've mastered that, you're at the end of the day, you're selling your art. If you're not a dope artist, people are not going to pay for your art. These backdrops are not just you know they're not they're they're literally art like we are essentially no different than a museum that people get to or a gallery that people get to film inside of what's going to make someone come to your gallery and pay top dollar to use you know what i mean so if you don't have that don't just rush into it like understand that you need to have a vision you need to have the ability to create it and make it happen and you got to be able to just fix problems adjust things so you got to have some carpentry skills you got to have some some minor like electrical skills um, know how to use tools, like things that people don't think about that. Where it's like, if you, cause if you don't do that, I mean, you're going to just spend endless amount of money on contractors, all the stuff that you don't even think about. Cause you just see the final product. Like, and, that, and I think we're all a little bit guilty of only promoting the final product. You know what I mean? So you see like this studio that's just glowing and you're like, Oh my God, like we must've been, they must've put that up in a week. You know what I mean? It's like, no man, there's trial and error behind that. There's mistakes. There's, endless amount of money that went into figuring out what's right and what's wrong it's like i mean paint alone do you like people don't understand how expensive paint is dude. it's the most expensive i mean it's just it adds up man furniture yeah um why as if people need you really need to understand what your capabilities are before you commit to this because it's a 24 at least for me it's a 24 7 grind like i put everything into this and there's not a day when i'm able to just take the day off like it's my it's problem solving all day long or someone broke this do i have another one readily available before I have 20 minutes to fix this light before my next client gets it because someone ruined that set. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, and if you build certain sets where you're dependent on, I don't know, objects or something that are rare, it's like, well, now you just lost your set. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So be realistic with what you're, what you're capable of doing for sure. For sure. Yeah, no, I think that's all solid. I definitely agree with just the fact that like, You're also on like other people's production time. You know what I mean? So like if something goes wrong on their set, like, and if your site rep can't fix it or you can, you know what I mean? You're going to have to fix that. Like, let's say like your middle row of LEDs go out on your set, like either you're going to have to refund them. And then you also have to think like they planned all this. Like, let's say it's actually a legit shoot. They have like an AC coming. They have steady cam. They have all these people coming that they're paying and then they get there and then just like something's completely broken that they were going to, you yeah. know what I mean? So that's there's a lot. We've, we've literally yeah. lost our key light at the very beginning of a shoot. Mm-hmm. And you just got to be a problem solver. You got to like, all right, who do I know that can get one in immediately? But you're right. Like things like that happen. You got to really, and that doesn't really hit home until that crew is at your door. And yeah. then you're like, you like, you open up your studio, like, oh, this is going to be dope. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, this is a big production. Things cannot go wrong. You know what I mean? This yeah. has to work like, if they plug in an extra light, we can't lose our, we can't pop a circuit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's so many little things that you don't realize, but, but that has to happen for you to understand the uh, importance of that. You know what I mean? For sure. So it's trial and error really is what it is. But, I mean, we still learn a lot of stuff every day, but yeah, you got to really be ready for, I mean, so much little things go wrong that you just got to be able to fix it. It's crazy. How long did it take um, you to, because you obviously said like, this doesn't go up in a week. How long did it take you to just build and get set up? just running for uh the vegas location it's like exactly a month okay so i think we got it in february 1st and we opened on march 1st and that was seven days a week i don't think i don't even know if i went back to san jose during that time i yeah. stayed here and it was endless like and i'll be here till two three four in the morning every day just knocking it out but that's mm-hmm. because i learned i already knew what i wanted to do oh yeah i think it feels like a it feels like a new endeavor that probably would have been more like a two two month process trying to figure it all out. But mm-hmm. I went in there with the game plan, I already had the layout of the space and that definitely helped. Like we hit the floor like running on this one. I think that was it. I think that's pretty much, I had one more question, but I don't think I can remember it. Oh, yeah. good, man. What, what do we got uh, coming next from Redwall? Anything we can look out for or? We are definitely looking at Los Angeles. Um, we're looking for the right spot. 
we've already took a tour down there didn't like anything that we've seen uh, it's so big out there that we thought we wanted to be in downtown and then quickly realized that probably not so we're gonna mm. look for more of an outskirt um so we wanted to be open by january it's probably not gonna happen because we're gonna find a spot first obviously like a month or two to build it so i would say we should be out there middle of next year probably cool in the meantime we're gonna focus on just adding touches here really you know that and just operation in general there's a, there's a dance studio to take care of music studio and the film set so definitely got our hands full with just with just that alone awesome sick so, and then if people want to follow along they can follow you at at redwall studios yeah then... follow the redwall studio one not my personal i'm not really active on the personal one just use sure. at redwall studio uh, the website's the redwall.com, but that's just really a landing page that takes you pretty much to directly book or to our Instagram. So Instagram's really, you know, we're such a visual company that everything's going to be on there. Awesome. Yes, Sick. Sir, cool. Man. I think that's pretty much it. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, we do not have a sponsor. So go check out cinepacks.com. We got lens filters and free packs there for you guys to download. Uh, make sure to give Sonny a follow on Instagram. Check out the studios. And if you're ever in San Jose, Vegas, or eventually down in LA, uh, definitely check out Redwall Studios. And anything else you want to say? Yeah, man, I appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. Thank you. You guys are killing it too, man. So. Thanks, man. Yeah, cool. All right. Thanks for listening, guys.